My special guest today is a sensational actor who for five years played one of the all-time great characters in the Bill's rich history. Today, as well as being a celebrated voiceover artist and occasionally enhancing scenes in front of a camera, he's enriching people's lives in an even more profound way as a communications coach. He's a qualified hypnotherapist, life coach, keynote speaker, oh, and legend. Ladies and gents worldwide, Bolton's back. Make some noise of a mighty Russell Bolter. Russ, welcome to the Bill podcast. Thank you very much. Listen, can I just hire you to sort of be around? <laughs> yeah, I'll just be in your corner. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can send you into a room before I walk in. I'm great. Job done. <laughs> Flipping heck, what have you got in the background there? Shit, that's it. Oh, There's a legend. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's so embarrassing. Makes you look like a bloody estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> that's really bad. <laughs> You're great. Ah, oh, get out of it. Yeah, look at that, look. No way, shit, man. Oh, flipping out. They used to make us hold those stupid files. <laughs> so embarrassing. So, you know, it's, it's, why? <laughs> yeah, service directory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You think, well, don't you know a bloody phone number by now? What's going on, you know? I, I don't think he paid much attention to the rule books anyway. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, you were watching then. Flipping yeah, out. Oh, yeah. Well, this is my era. I mean, I grew up watching this. Sort of oh, really? Months. Okay. Yeah. When my okay. mum and dad in the, well, 95, when you joined regularly, was when I first started watching oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, and I used to watch it with my nan and granddad. Oh, wow. Wow. I watched wow. your episode where you got killed off in my great grand's living room, my other nan, as we called her. Oh, and lovely. She she said, "Oh, I think he's a goner." <laughs> <laughs> oh, say hello to your nan for me. Oh, I certainly will. Bless you. I will. I'm, I'm hearing a lovely twang in your voice. So you're a bit West Country there. Yeah, Plymouth boy originally. Oh, yeah. lovely, lovely. I'm in Bristol, so I'm not too far away oh, from you. Oh wow! Oh, my mum and dad were in Bordrip until, oh. well, they they retired and moved to France five years oh. ago. Why not? Why not? Yeah, Why would yeah. you not do that? On, you know? on, a, on a whim, yeah. It just all uh, all happened very quickly. But yeah, they're very, yeah. They're very happy. But yeah, I've still got my nan and my nana and my cousins down in uh, Plymouth. Oh, so Smashing. And I see there's a bit of James Bond action going on in the background. Yeah, but a bit, bit of Lazenby. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't get... License to Kill is my favourite, but I couldn't get that poster. Oh, I, right, I okay. Honour and Majesty Secret Service is an underrated yeah. Bond. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, oh, just, yeah. he did the one, didn't he? Yeah, he yeah. He did the one. Should've... And I know a bit of Doctor Who as well. Very good taste, sir. We, we need to get you in Doctor Who. That's oh, no, no, no. I, I, I once met an actor who plays uh, a Cyberman. Oh, really? Oh, what yeah, you... yeah. No, it was a great gig because he used to get killed every week and then he could just go back. <laughs> I said, I wish I, I wish I could have done that. But... Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's how Graham Cole started, of course. With uh, yes, he, he a... did, didn't he? Yeah. He did, he did. There's, and there's also in the seventies. I think that was the worst time to be in Doctor Who because I think they just discovered bubble wrap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you've, got, you've got all these monsters basically wrapped in stationery. <laughs> yeah. no. No. <laughs> not good. I love it. I love not it. Good luck. You're helping people in, in this crazy lockdown situation. You, you gave me a sneak peek of the work you've been doing to, to help people do this sort of stuff. So would yeah. you mind telling us a bit about that, please? Well, um, well, the world went mad, didn't it? So, so I mean, <laughs> everybody's having to kind of rethink everything. So what I was doing before lockdown was I was coaching people to communicate. So anything from um, uh, people standing up trying to raise money for their businesses or uh, people doing keynote speeches or charities trying to raise money, and usually that's face-to-face. And then, of course, what happens is, we can't meet face to face. We've got to do it in these kind of ridiculous circumstances. So, so what I was noticing was um, people are just making some cardinal errors. So, if I show you what they are, yes, um, please. One horrible error is because because we're our cameras now are on these flat screen things. They can be at like a weird angle like that. <laughs> so you like that. Or this is a terrible. <laughs> You know, or then people are sort of over here really insignificant. <laughs> and I don't know if you watch news nights, but you see oh. politicians, right? So lighting, you suddenly don't want to be in a horror film, <laughs> which is what happens. So there's a whole thing about just getting a few basics. So what I say is, look, get in the center. Actors will kill you for center stage. Get yourself in the center. That's your new frame. And, and 
let your hands be there. Because um, it turns out, by the way, if you watch a TED talk and yeah. you can't see someone's hands, you can half their viewing figures. So we wow. human beings have a really huge uh, commitment to seeing this. I can yeah. see you've got no weapons. And if yeah, you're yeah. a communicator, I can't see your hands. I'm instantly in the back of my mind going, why, why can't I see your hands? What's going on? So there's something about you take your center stage and then the big skill is find your camera. So if I go there, so I just have to treat the camera as if it's a person who likes me. Yeah. And I think that's basically the, that's the core of, of acting technique. If you look at any really great TV actors, and I actually learned this on the bill, watching other actors who are in there every day, is they all have a relationship with the camera. It's just the camera's the other person in the scene, but you just don't look them in the eyes. And you have a relationship with the camera. And that connection means that when the viewer is watching you on screen, they feel a connection with you. So psychologically, if you just have that idea, the camera's a person who likes and respects me, I like and respect that person. There's a sort of weird thing that happens. And it, I'll, I'll probably ruin every other movie for you now, but you, you, you look at the actors you like yeah. and you relate to, and there's, some, there's a tension with them with the camera. So how you translate that if you're online now is you just have to make eye contact with the camera. Yeah. So, yeah. Gene Hackman's a favourite film actor. Oh, come on, come yeah. on. Just come on. Do you know he had the right to Silence of the Lambs? No. And he sat on it for like five or six years and he sold it for a pittance. He's one of the most unlucky people like in the world. He all, Well, he turned down Unforgiven a lot. And it, no. It, yeah, I, Eastwood. Had to, uh, Eastwood had to like really persuade him because he didn't want to do it. He felt it was at a time with the Rodney King murders. Like, it was a bad time to be doing violent films, and Eastwood was like, "This is an anti-violent movie. Yeah. Please do it." And of course, Hackman won an Oscar for it. So that was one. He he got lucky there. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Gene Hackman as Hannibal Lecter. Wow. And um, uh, um, would have been really cool, wouldn't it? Would have been well, really cool. here here's a here's a. It's funny. Six degrees here. Um, Anthony Hopkins was very good friends in his early days um, of his career with Bernard Holly, who guest starred in one of your first regular episodes of The Bill. Bernard's a dear friend of mine. He's 80 wow. now. And wow. um, he recalls Anthony Hopkins in 1972 sitting in his armchair saying, I'm never going to make it. The insecurities of, of the acting profession. It's bloody universal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Even Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins, the new Ford Mondeo. <laughs> <laughs> and Bernard, I mean, we'll come on to the bill because we've got lots to talk about before then, but Bernard, um, I showed him uh, his... He, 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 he played Gwyneth Strong's husband whose stepdaughters ran away. But turns out they've been having an affair and she's 15 and a half. It's, one oh, of right, you, it's, okay. it's the first episode you get top billing on. And Bernard... A recalled that you he said he was such a good actor, but he also recalled you really went out of your way to make him as a guest visiting actor feel very welcome, and you talked to him a lot, like in between takes. And he he twenty five years on, he hasn't forgotten that. So I thought Look that give you Look a little act. glow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Look, good manners don't cost you anything, you know. Well, indeed. well, I remember I remember being a guest on the bill. I started as a guest. Yeah. I did one up, and I just remembered everyone being so friendly to me. Mm. And, and that was the culture, you know, you, it was like um, the vibe, the feeling was like the old rep theatres used to feel is that, yeah. so anyone coming in, you'd have to make them as comfortable as you could, because when you started working, you just had to do it. Mm. So the, the quicker you could make someone feel comfortable, the easier your, your day was. That was the, that's the kind of idea, I think, around that. Well, but that please give him my love. and I certainly um, will, bless you. Thank I you will. to be remembered. Yeah. Well, that, that must play a massive part in the work you're doing now to make people feel comfortable and build trust. So how how did you begin? I, I'm always fascinated with actors who branch out, you know, who, who create new opportunities and careers for themselves. So how did the communications work begin and, and where did your interest begin? I, um, so I, I left the bill in 2000. So, so about, so let's cut sort of seven, eight years down the line. And I'd been lucky enough to do all the stuff I wanted to do. You know, I'd had a crack at the Shakespeare parts I'd wanted to have a go at. I'd done the musical theater thing. 
Uh, and I was finding I was either cast as a policeman or a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I ended up doing an episode of Waking the Dead. And in one day, uh, I had to film killing someone and shoving them down an air conditioning unit. And then in the afternoon, raping his wife. <laughs> and I, I got home that day and I just went, I didn't go to drama school for this. This yeah. is, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not feeling it anymore. Right. And then the next day we did an ex, uh, a, a, a whole session where I got blown up. So I spent surrounded by pyrotechnics and then covered in plaster. And I just thought, I'm, I had to, I, I, this is horrible moment when you go, my first love, which was this vocation to be an actor that I'd always had, um, was in question. And I, I just wasn't feeling it. And, and right about that time, I started working at Bristol Orbit Theatre School. And I was helping a lot of the young actors there. And I was doing sort of improvisation classes and acting classes and uh, TV screen master classes. And I loved it. And I was getting as much, of, in fact, no, I was getting more of a buzz helping other actors find that, whatever that is, than I was attempting to find it myself. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I accidentally um, got called in to help a business uh, guy who'd lost like a million quid's worth of business because he had a basic inability to listen. He just wasn't listening to his clients. He was so insecure. And, and most of acting is about listening. You know, if you don't listen in a scene, you can't really do the scene. So what I realized was that people in business really need this stuff actors need. So I just started doing it. And then I realized I was making quite a good living at it. And then I realized I was enjoying it. And then I thought, well, I don't have to pretend to kill anyone anymore. So I just, <laughs> it was just, it was a natural... It was a natural move. So, so now I'm in the fortunate position that I'm making most of my living doing that. I have the side hustle on the, on the documentaries. Occasionally, I'll be dragged back in to do a bit of acting. But I, um, it might change. It might change. But at the minute, I'm, I'm just enjoying making a living and um, shouting at chief executives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's taken you all over the world, isn't it? I've been lucky enough to do a bit of traveling, yeah. It's, it's funny, but the same universal problems are all over the world. So if you're, if you're sitting in Hong Kong or Singapore or somewhere in Japan or somewhere in the US or Canada, you know, all around the world, human beings are human beings. And uh, it's difficult to communicate effectively with other human beings. And it turns out actors, you know, spend a bit of time thinking about that. So we might have something useful to say. And it must be... You must constantly be learning new tricks, I imagine, like new insight must. Well, that's why, that's why I trained to be a hypnotherapist, which is weird, because I was working with a lot of clients and they're just phobic about public speaking. You look at the list of fears that gets published every year in the US. Um, so fear of snakes, uh, heights, that's at three or four. Public speaking is number one. Wow. Death. Death is number seven. <laughs> you know, so people are terrified of it and, and it is it's a frightening thing you know unless you unless you've got the weird acting gene where you actually enjoy it yeah so i think so i realized that if, if i had a client who was phobic about it it wasn't a technical issue it was a kind of mind issue so i got interested in uh, nlp and i i spent a year training to be a hypnotherapist because there's a thing called a fast phobia cure so if you understand how someone learns a fear subconsciously you can undo it quite quickly and i wanted to learn that skill because um you know if you're if you're standing in front of a bunch of people and you know there's 20 million quids worth of investment on the table and you blow it that's going to kick off a phobia unless you know what you're doing in your head um and it was also inspired by i was helping an actor at bristol old vic and they said look this really isn't fair that person who went in for that audition is really lazy but they were great in the audition I work my arse off and I go in there and fall apart. Why is that? And I couldn't answer the question. So I had to go away and work out, well, why is that the case? What is it you're doing in your head to yourself before you start speaking? Because that's where you win or lose. So um, I think it's just a question of if you want to do something, you learn what you need to learn to do the thing you want to do. I don't think learning works in the abstract. If you want to, you want to change something or do something or that's when you'd be willing to put the kind of work into learn. And, and for me, that's, I'm interested in learning stuff that I can use to help people. That's, that's kind of what, that's what dings my bell. Yeah. On your 
Sun Hill colleague Greg Donaldson is now a psychotherapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out that was yeah, yeah. Look at the state of us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it's brilliant. It's yeah. fantastic. Greg helped someone very dear to me, and and I I loved going to to yeah. meet him and 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 chat and and it had helped him, and he thought, well, this fantastic. If fantastic. if I, if I can help others as well, um, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is fantastic. And are you able from? lockdown to also do voiceovers remotely i was gonna have a go at building a little studio in me in me cupboard um, yeah. but fortunately there's a studio in bristol with a window in the booth ah. so i can climb in through the window <laughs> wow uh, <laughs> and they just they just it's like it's like you're in prison and they shove a cup of tea Right. In, in yeah. yeah, you have Tony O'Callaghan shoving it through a little. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the prison cell. There you go, mate. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, I'm able to still do that. But I'm, I live in Bristol and the Natural History Unit for the BBC is down the road. So uh, a, a gig I've got is that it turns out I'm David Attenborough's stunt double. <laughs> um, so what, what happens is, uh, this seems sacrilegious to me, but in the English-speaking world, you know, in France or wherever it is, they go, uh, but who is this old man who is doing this amazing, we do not understand why you have this old English man. And they, they go, it's David Amber. And they go, but we do not know who he is. So they were just looking for a voice that was like a, a steady British voice for the rest of the world that isn't clued up um, in, in who David is. So, so, That's so, uh, you. <laughs> so they, they picked me and I, I'm his, yeah. But I, I, I stood next to him once. I was too nervous to speak to him. Really? Bless you. Premier, and I went up to him and I wanted to, and I thought, well, what am I going to say? I, I'm no. the guy, I'm the, I'm your, I'm your nemesis or something. And I, I did, and I was, I was too scared. I mean, he's a legend, you know? What can you yeah. Do? You must learn so much there because like, you know, you're one of the first people to see this amazing footage. That oh, listen, I, capture. I would pay to do it. I couldn't, I can't believe my luck that I'm doing these. Um, and what's great is they bring um, the crew in because they want to see the voiceover going on it. And so you get all the stories. So, so I had the lady who'd gone down in a submersible to the Mariana Trench. And I just went, well, what was that like? And she told me the story. So they're like three hours down. It takes like five hours to descend. And she's in a bubble on one side. And there's a guy next to her, a camera guy. And then there's the driver, the pilot of the, of the sub. So they're, they're sinking like that. And she just goes, um, what's that? There's a, bit of, there's a bit of water there. What's, what's that? And the driver goes, oh, bit of gaffer tape for you. <laughs> oh. Just spin it up. And she goes, oh, okay, just... here's a towel. <laughs> they descend, they film, they come back up, and then she finds out that in that moment, there was a crack in the sob. And she said, well, why didn't you tell me? He said, well, there's nothing I could do. If, if, if at that point it had cracked, we, we just would have been crushed to death. So that Whoa. gaffer was either going to work or not. There's no point in panicking you. <laughs> wow. And, she, and you just go, oh, God, that's like... So you get to hear fantastic stories, uh, these, these people who do these. And, th and that whole series is just a, it's just a delight. And what's amazing as well is it really put the, the plastic issue on the agenda, which is a really wonderful thing. And they've, they've been hesitating from making that obvious a kind of environmental statement for years because they, uh, and, and they went ahead and did it and good on them. And I think it, it's, it's informed the debate, which is brilliant. Where did the uh, the bug begin for you? When did you discover this this acting talent you have? So I went to a pretty rough um, secondary school in Warrington, and the deal was you uh, you were supposed to be lucky if you left school and you got a job in a factory. So in the middle of all that, for a reason I don't really understand, drama was still on the curriculum. So that was the only thing I could do. And then I got this music teacher who came into the school and she put on a show. Um, and because no one did drama in the school, there's like four of us who were interested in it. She cast the play with some of the other teachers and we put it on for the Christmas show. So I'm standing in the wings next to my maths teacher and physics teacher who were like rock hard, you know, it was proper, it was probably like Victorian school, you know, you got beaten regularly and all of that. And, and we were about to go on stage and they were bricking themselves. And I wasn't. And I, I calmed them down. And then I walked on the stage and I could just do it. And then the next day at school, I went from like the kid that got bullied a bit to 
back of the bike shed, offered the cigarette. Um, the girl I'd fancied for two years, little note goes around in maths. Hey. And I just went, this would be a nice job. That was, <laughs> that was it. And I, I think it was like, um, I suddenly found like, there's something I could do. And for some bizarre reason, I just didn't feel fear in front of a bunch of people. So, so that was it. So, so then it sort of gave me a bit of an identity that I could be an actor. Um, and it just gave me some, it gave me a way out of, of sort of a horrible, horrible, dark Dickensian style um, background. Um, so by the time I was 18, I'd managed to get to, to drama school, but I, I loved it. I just loved the feeling of being on a stage and connecting that, that was the thing that I just loved. And, and I loved the moment when, you know, what, I, what started to dawn on me is if you tell the truth out loud, people respond. And for me, that's what acting is, you know, and it, my, my big acting hero is um, Jimmy Cagney. And his whole, um, his whole approach to acting was, stand on the floor, look the other guy in the eye, tell the truth. And I just thought, yeah, that's acting. That, that's what it is. Um, so um, that's where it started for me. Have there been any performing genes in your family? Um, no, wow. no. Well, well, not well. If you're from Liverpool, basically, you come tap dancing out your mother's womb. You know, so <laughs> so every, everybody's an actor in Liverpool. So it's sort of there in the background. But you know, just I don't know what happened, but I, I seem to find a way to make a living doing it. That was the that was the only difference between me and anyone else from there for a bit. You know, and and you like were at the Royal Shakespeare Company. That's yeah, well, I, I really got into Shakespeare, and it was partly because I'd never read Shakespeare till I got to drama school, uh, and I was suddenly thinking, "Hang on a minute, this is oh, this is just a story," and it was this, this thing Shakespeare's for these really clever posh people, and I just went, "No, no, 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 I I can do this." So there was a kind of um. It, it was kind of red rag to a bull, really. I just thought, no, Q, I'm, I'm having a go at this. Um, and I loved it. I, I just loved the whole thing. It's because the stories are so good. The bottom line is he wouldn't be being done 400 years later if the stories weren't good. And if, if you tell the story, it's great. If you don't, it's awful. You know, I've sat through Shakespeare production. I'm just thinking, I've played several Shakespeare roles. I don't know what the hell's going on here. Why is everyone <laughs> laughing? But if, if you tell the story... Bang, you know, amazing. So, so, so I really got into Shakespeare. And I thought, honestly, that's what I was going to do out of drama school. But, um, uh, and I started at the RSC. So I, but I started as an understudy, really. So I was, I was in there thinking, okay, this is my apprenticeship. I'm just going to watch uh, all these great actors I get a chance to work with. And I'm just going to absorb. So I got to watch people like Alan Rickman and Fiona Shaw and David Suchet and Ben Kingsley. These amazing actors who like night after night after night after night, just bring it. And, and watching how they did it was, was just a, I just sat there like a sponge for about a year and a half, just right. I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn. Um, but, but then that's not the way it went for a while. So I, um, I, I mean, I was lucky enough to have a crack at the Shakespearean stuff I wanted to do. Um, but again, I went for the psychopaths. I went for Richard III, uh, uh, Maccas, you know. Yeah. Um, You've done Hamlet as well, haven't you? Yeah, I had a crack at Hamlet. I had a yeah. crack at Hamlet. Um, that's like, that's the three, isn't it? You know, it's the three you want, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the trio. I yeah, never, yeah. I was never, never going to do Romeo. And, and the bottom line is, if you're old enough to play King Lear, you're not fit enough to carry Cordelia around. So it's a, it's a hell of a part to ask anyone to do. So I'm, 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 I'm done with Shaky, really. I've had me bite of the cherry. Um uh, 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 yeah, yeah, I was wow. lucky enough. To do it. I, it, it, uh, Hamlet was just a, oh man, it was hard work. You want you want to try doing Hamlet on a matinee day? It's not fun, right? You know, it's yeah. it's, it's you doing that for four hours, mm. and then you have a fight at the end, you know, and you don't get the girl. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you break into television? Because you'd done a lot of telly before the bill. So how did that happen? I'm trying to think back. I mean, that, that was always the thing, you see, because at the RSC when I left is I realised that you, you weren't really able to get the good casting unless you'd done TV or a movie. So I just thought, right, I want to do Shakespeare. To get taken seriously by casting directors, I need to be on the telly. So I just used to write to um, producers of shows that I liked and just said, look, here's my photo, here's my CV. I'd love to meet for a reading if there's anything. Uh, 
any parts available. And I, you know, as a rule, as an actor, um, I, I just used to write five or six letters a week. That's what I used to do. Um, I, be, I learned that from William Hartnell, one of the first Doctor Who's. He was always writing letters to get the next job. Yeah. So back in the back in the eighties when I started, people wrote letters. So I I used to do that, and I I'd written to the Bill a few times, and, and they, they were one of the first uh, companies to see me, and they they were. And they gave me a really nice part in an episode. And then, you know, they offered me a regular and, and that was great. But it was, uh, um, my, my big break actually came in a, in a series called Watching that used to be um, in, the, in the late 80s. And um, uh, I, I got a series and that was like a sitcom. So it's a combination of theatre and TV. So you filmed a lot of it in front of a live audience. Then you did the location. So it was like straight away you're working with an audience and a camera and you're trying to tell the story. So it was, it was just a great education. Although some of the, the directors in Manchester, Granada, were notorious. Like there was one director and he only ever gave two acting notes. No, he gave three. I'll tell you his two main acting notes. The first acting note was when he saw your rehearse, could you do it a bit better? <laughs> his second acting note was, that wasn't very good. And his third acting note, which he only gave once in 20 years, to a supporting artist walking in the background, he said, why are you walking like that as if you shit your pants? <laughs> that, was, that was the only help you got. Only help wow. you got. So, so it was like, you had to work it out by watching the other actors. And, and if an actor had been in the game for a while, you, you, you know, your job as an actor was just to what? okay, how are they doing that? How they and, and, you know, they were usually nice enough in the green room to say, look, I've got this scene. I'm a bit worried about this. Have you got any advice for me? And, and that was what was lovely about um, those shows in those days. It was still very like the old rep theatres is, is actually help each other. And, and that's, whenever that goes on in a show, I mean, I just think it makes the work better because you can, you sense there's a group of people working together. Um, and I, so for me, for me that, that was my, my foray into TV acting was just an attempt to have a crack at Shakespeare. And then, I realized, hang on a minute, I actually enjoy the telly and, and they pay better, so. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you know. Uh, but, oh, but then, of course, you know, I reached the stage of my career when I thought, how many different ways can you say stop police? You know, you run out of, <laughs> you run out of options. <laughs> you know? Well, sometimes you didn't even bother to say stop police. You know, <laughs> ra- yeah. Ra- well, the first shot of you at Bolton is you ramming a man's head into a pavement. <laughs> <laughs> by his hair <laughs> it was oh, it was funny all that well i think what they were really good at on the bill was when you started they'd make you go and hang out with real policemen so i got sent to this uh real nick in in bethnal green and i, I hung out for a day with a bunch of detectives who were doing some drugs busts and then you know i went out and had lunch with them and i got to know them a bit and i the thing that struck me was, with a lot of them, is they were literally willing to put their life on the line to save other people. But that meant that if anything went wrong in someone's life, they just wanted the biggest, nastiest, most aggressive policeman they could get to protect them. But they would not invite that person to a party or, or go out for a drink with them. So they were, they were either loved or ostracized. And I'd never understood that about the police before. And hanging out with them, I just thought, that's really hard, that's a tension. You know, drama's about tension and conflict. And so I I just started to talk to a few of them about how they dealt with that in different ways. And so so that was the sort of first hint at a thought of how I could actually have a crack at playing Bolton. And then the the writer was, uh, Mark Wingert's brother, Matt Wingert, who created the character. And his whole idea was, what happens if someone was basically a good person, but they go through a traumatic experience of losing someone they loved in that situation? What does that make them like? So that was the backstory, that there was this unresolved pain and aggression. So on the surface, he just looked like a maniac who was bashing people up but he had a reason to do it. And I think 
one of the one of the actors that had a big influence on me when I first started was uh, was Anthony Sher, and at the time he was at the RSC, and he wrote a book about how he approached playing Richard the Third, and something really struck me when I read his book. He was saying, um, "It's not enough to be an actor; you have to decide what you've got to say as an actor. You know, what do you believe? Do you believe people are genuinely good, but they do bad things for a reason?" Or do you think some people are just bad? And, and whatever you believe will inform the way you play something. So it's not a neutral thing. If you don't have a view and you're just saying lines, you won't ever have a performance that's worth watching. There's no mystery to it. There's no intrigue. There's no tension. So I just thought, okay, I'm going to have a go of playing this guy who on the surface is horrible. But occasionally there's a glimpse of there might be a reason for that and there's some goodness in there. Because I thought that would give other people something to play off. And it's a team game. It was a team game on the bill. So it was all about the chemistry that you could spark with other actors. That's how I went about that, really. And then, of course, you know, I did it for five years. So, so then you can't just keep doing that. And it develops and changes. And then you give the character new stuff. And then towards the end, I really enjoyed it because it was like suddenly in the relationship with Stanton that brings you the character to an end, it opened up again. And then there's this horrible irony. It just when he starts to stop being a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone, someone who bashes other people's heads in, he gets his own head bashed in. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe there's some kind of, uh, there, there you go. The moral arc there. of the universe got him. Yeah. In there, you know. Well, one of my favorite of your scenes, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a Greg Donaldson episode where he's got himself in a bit of a mix and he has a lovely scene with like each of you individually getting advice okay. and it's just a, a lovely character moment with you both from the canteen and uh you know bolton's having his dinner and he just said well look if i were you i'd just say look i can't <laughs> actually keep your name out of this now you know you you, you so you're oh, gonna no. have to testify and uh, greg plays it wonderfully and the reaction for you greg just says as tom well that's not fair and the look of disdain on your face. You just say, so, what's fair? And you launch into this, look, we're all a bit different. You know, um, I, I don't care whether she's slept and had an affair with her wife. There's a psycho out there and I'd want to nick him. But then again, we're all different, Tom. You just carry oh, on. Oh, wow, wow. It's Flipping a great out. little scene, but the look of absolute disgust on Bolton's face, your whole manner changes in a split second about the word fairness. And I just think it's a cracking little character moment. Um, that's one of my favourites. Oh, that. that's interesting. Because that, that was the... That's interesting. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> The really frustrating thing from my point of view is I haven't even seen them. I mean, I did them, we filmed them, and you'd look at the monitor to check the angles. And occasionally you'd watch it. But if your job was to be filming that like 12 hours a day. If you got home and it was on the telly, you didn't yeah, so watch it. thing you want to look at, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so then, and then the years roll by and then you leave it. And in the back of my mind, I was always going, I'll watch them someday. And, and I, now I remember that scene, now you tell me. And I remember the day I filmed it, suddenly it's come back in my head. But I'm just thinking, I mean, at the moment, occasionally it'll come on TV and I've got two daughters who are um, 11 and eight. They were flicking through the CBeebies channel. And then an episode of The Bill came up with me in. And they just did this moment where they went, and then they looked at me, and they looked, and they went, what? Dad, what happened? Oh, no. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, shit. Oh, no. You know, that, that's hurtful. Um, but no, it is 20 you years ago. be playing him now. It is 20 years ago. So, so I, I think... Um, I'd, I'd actually like to go back now and actually watch them um, because, because we used to, you know, the, the, we, the people, the actors working on that, like Greg, Mark Winger, Billy Murray, Joy, all the, all the actresses, actors on that, Trudy, they put their heart and soul into that show and we'd spend ages making sure it was right. We were really tight. But because we had to then do the next one, and the next one, and sometimes you'd be filming like three simultaneously, there was no time to stop and take in what you've done. <laughs>